Good morning, everyone. Welcome, Welcome to day five of May 2021. We are on the last day of part two. Tomorrow, we will start part three, redesign ASEAN. And there will be more day to go until September 30, 2021. Today, there are three panel discussions and one documentary. In the morning, we will start with panel discussion on transboundary health pollution in Southeast Asia, facts and solutions, and followed by panel discussion on impact of trade agreement and policy to food sovereignty in Asia. In the afternoon, there will be a panel discussion on the strike I restore the May concrete post rules in revitalizing the Korean ecology ruling by them from Sungkram River to Tulesa. And we will end the day by documentary, it's not the same, produced by Thai PBS in 2019. The first session in the row of today is a panel discussion on transboundary haze pollution in Southeast Asia, facts and solutions. It's organized by the Regional Center for Social Science and Sustainable Development. And this panel is going to moderate it by uh, Gil Jaiyo, the Malaysia, from Malaysia Bar Council Environment and Climate Change Committee. May I invite Gil Chaiyo on screen, please? Good morning. Good morning, Chaiyo. So before I hand over the floor to you, let me give the in brief introduction of you to all the audience. So Gil Chaiyo was called to the Malaysian Bar in, 20, in 2004 and is a partner of law firm in Petaling Jaya. <laughs> He was the deputy chairman of the committee for the term 2012 to 2013 before his awarding a training scholarship by the British government to the in law, master in environmental law in London. Currently, Jai Yao is a co-deputy chair of the Bar Council Environment and Climate Change Committee. Good morning again, Jai Yao. How are you today? I'm very well, thank you. Thanks okay. for the uh, kind introduction. Okay, so besides what I have introduced you early, so are you working on any projects right now? Um, yes, I'm working on a haze research project actually at the moment um, to look into um, 
launching a perhaps a, a complaint with the National Human Rights uh, Institution in Malaysia um, based on haze pollution. That's, that's very interesting work you are doing right now. So I guess the audience are ready and also our panelists are ready. So I hand over the floor to you, Jayo. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Um, thanks for inviting me uh, to be part of this very interesting panel. Um, now in this session uh, entitled Transboundary Haze Pollution in Southeast Asia, Facts and Solutions, we will discuss the transboundary haze pollution in two areas, um, namely in the sub-region of Mekong, up north of Southeast Asia, and the haze pollution, the transboundary haze pollution uh, from Indonesia emanating towards uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Brunei, and uh, Thailand, and, and sometimes other countries as well. So uh, we will start with the Mekong uh, haze, transboundary haze pollution discussion uh, with, uh, we have today uh, Tara Wakamsri with us, and then followed by uh, a discussion of the Indonesian haze um, with a discussion with uh, Wayu Padana and Shamila Arifin. So uh, I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion where we can uh, simultaneously look at these two uh, persistent problems that we have and, and see what are the challenges and opportunities um, that are available. So uh, I, in the first half of the session today, this panel, uh, we will have uh, the presentation from three of the panelists. And in the second half, uh, then it will be a more interactive discussion. And uh, I look forward to the questions from the audience. And also maybe I'll invite the panelists to ask each other questions as well uh, for a more interactive discussion. So uh, let us get started. Um, I will start now with Mr. Tara Bwakamsri. Uh, Tara uh, is the founding member of Greenpeace Southeast Asia. He has been a campaigner for the organization since 1998. Tara became Greenpeace Southeast Asia's campaign director in 2011. He then became Greenpeace Thailand's country director in 2014. Now, without further ado, Tara, I uh, yield the floor to you. Please proceed with your presentation. Uh <clears throat> Greetings from Bangkok, everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction. So my, my story today is about transboundary haze pollution in greater Mekong region, tragedy of the commodity. So I would like to share the screen so that uh, you, we, we can follow uh, the, the story here. Um, The every every January to March, the number of small fires spring up across countryside of upper ASEAN region. Uh, this period actually bring cool and dry weather. It's a perfect condition for burning. Number of days uh, moderate to dense smoke haze observed over area based on satellite imagery and also ground observation and uh, air quality report uh, from January to April. Uh, this this uh, map is uh, 2020 and 2021. So um, for example, in March 2020, uh, we see hair situation over Mekong region uh, uh, widespread. Then has observed from Eastern Myanmar, Northern and Central Thailand. Uh, in April 20, 2020, also enlarged uh, 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 into uh, over Myanmar, Northern Lao PDR, Northern and Central Thailand. Uh, in in 20, 2020, you, uh, we see the, 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 same, the same pattern of, of uh, head pollution across uh, northern part of ASEAN. Uh, the Tan Pottery head pollution continue, continue to be a challenge for, for many government in, in the region. Uh, also air quality worsening uh, across the, 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 the period uh, from December to May. Uh, this, this map actually, it, it's uh, from 
uh, ASEAN Specialized Meteorological Center based in Singapore. Uh, when when it come to to head pollution, we 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 hear the story, right? People light fire in Southeast Asia for several reasons. Uh, in the forest area, small scale uh, subsistence farmer practice uh, so called sweet and agriculture or slat and burn. That that uh, one perspective. The technique that involves cutting down tree, uh, letting the wood dry out for the few months and burn it and clear the field. Hunter gatherers sometimes start fire to, to actually capture animal. Uh, people collecting mushrooms sometimes burn the forest floor to make it easier for the for, for, for it. Locker you try to clear road and clear land. So this 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 explanation actually in the mainstream media and a popular perception that has been with uh, uh, the, the paradigm that actually ignore the fact that human interaction with ecological system actually uh, developed through time and influenced by institutional factors. Uh, it seems that existing social condition and relationship seem to be permanent, universal, uh, but if we seen from other aspects, for example, sociological standpoint, uh, a tragedy of common idea the tragedy of common the idea around this actually very sim, uh, simplistic and one-sided that try to explain human social condition behavior human agency without first understanding of the historical social organization so this uh, uh that that why uh, my story is uh try to uh, look at other perspective it, it actually when it's come to greater Mekong hedge pollution is the tragedy of commodity. So we have to take that approach and uh, look at the role of uh, growth imperative of capitalism and commodification in producing international and institution rule, uh, which nature and common and resources are governed and historically transformed. So actually, ecological system never altogether free of social influence, right? Rather, they are shaped by social condition, including norm, tradition, economic, organization, labor, and political legal arrangement. For example, we have Stranvaduri Heads Agreement in, in ASEAN, for example. Uh, uh, one thing around this is uh, the role of ADB, ASEAN uh, Development Bank, uh, that uh, proposing in 1992 to have a program of sub-regional economic cooperation to enhance economic relation. Uh, they are going to look at uh, agriculture development, energy, environment, health, human resources development, social, uh, special economic zone, tourism transport uh, across uh, Mekong, greater Mekong region. Um, some of the country of Mekong region also promoted model of agriculture modernization based on large scale land development, as, as we know. Um, so uh, we, we can see uh, in, in, the, in the table agriculture and tree plantation concession and mining concession. Uh, we don't have uh, data in Thailand and some part in Vietnam, but we see that. A uh, smallholder farmer cultivated area actually is uh, very big, but if we compare the the owner of concession, mining concession, plantation concession across Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar, you see uh, very few uh, of, of people actually uh, own a large piece of land uh, that aim for agriculture modernization in 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 uh, Greater Mekong. Um, this one, um, we also uh, look at uh, economic land concession from the global forest was in uh, on the on on the on the on the right on the on the right map on the left map uh, in Cambodia. 
uh, in uh, economic land concession actually is show in yellow. Mining concession show in pink is is covering uh, across Cambodia, and uh, also uh, according to the the data from from uh, satellite map, we see um, the how uh, cumulative fire detection, which concentrated around or near um, eco those or economic land concession or mining concession in Cambodia, but this relationship between uh, fire uh, occurrence and haze pollution from this area uh, not really uh, really uh, having a compre comprehensive understanding and study. Another uh, issue that uh, related to haze pollution in Mekong region is uh, something to do with commodity driven deforestation uh, collected by Global Forest Watch. We, we can actually see um, <clears throat> the, 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 uh, the the loss, the three cover loss by commodity driven deforestation across five countries in Greater Mekong. Uh, for example, Laos uh, lost losing 50% of forest land um, <clears throat> to the to the crop, mainly uh, maize, cassava, sugarcane. Uh, according to Ang Tat study, maize is the second most important cash crop after rice in Laos. Supply chain of maize play an important role in government policy in the rural development of, of, of Laos. Maize is also one of the commodity for export. Uh, the main market also is China, Thailand, and Vietnam for feed, animal feed industry. Uh, the official document of Laos also indicated maize production is a cornerstone of economic development. Uh, Maize is grown in uh, Shayaburi, Udom Chai, Chiang Kwang, and Hua Pan in upper part of Lao. Hybrid maize variation make up majority of the crop. 77% of the growner in Shayaburi is a Wanta Pacific crop from Thailand. 28% uh, is CP variety. You know CP, right? Particularly CP egg, egg, egg. According to the Foreign Agriculture Service, 72% of maize used in Vietnam animal feed business imported maize uh, from the province of Chiang Huang, for example. Uh, the study uh, done by uh, Greenpeace Thailand, we look at uh, three area in Myanmar, Chan State, Northern Thailand and Laos. Uh, not allowed. We look at the the changing forest landscape to maize production uh, from two, uh, 200, 2016 to 2020, six year in a row. Uh, this is this is the figure in 2016. Sorry, 2016. And then when it's come to 20, 2020, this is increased. Uh, we see an increase of. Uh, of changing forest landscape to maize production, mainly industrial maize production around six, six million light across Chan State, Northern Laos and Northern Thailand. Um, we also look at look at the, the hotspot occurring in those area and uh, overlay with the uh, with with the land use and land cover. Uh, about two thirds of the hotspot found in Chan State. Northern Lao and Northern Thailand uh, is it uh, from uh, forest. The 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 one third is uh, on from maize production, and the rest is from other crops, sugarcane and other agriculture. So this is this is the combination of the forest fire, and also uh, open burning in agriculture and industrial agriculture that. Uh, for export. Um, another another aspect when it's come to when it's come to uh, transboundary haze pollution in the part of northern ASEAN, 
uh, is also coming from fossil fuel uh, development. The map shows in the red dot is is uh, plan uh, plan coal fired power plant across South Asia and also East Asia, South Korea and Japan and Taiwan. But the the, the key point I want to raise here is that uh, because of uh, fossil fuels uh, power plant, especially coal plant, uh, emitting a lot of pollution, including uh, PM two point five and also other other pollutant that can be uh, having a long long range travel across across the area. Uh, surprisingly. Uh, Lao government uh, recently approved a Singapore energy firm plan to build 1,000 megawatt coal fire power plant in the province of Sekong, I think on the southern part of Lao, uh, very close to Vietnam border. The, 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 the plan, the proposed coal fire power plant in this, in Sekong province is not built yet, but it's planned to export power to Thailand. Uh, Cambodia and also Vietnam. It it will be the second largest coal fire power plant in Laos after after uh, Hong Sa. So uh, this this uh, contributing to to more or less transboundary head pollution in northern part of ASEAN. Um, so in 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 uh, this regard. We, we see that we cannot ignore the fact that the, the transboundary head pollution around greater Mekong region has to be uh, deeply studied and need more explore and uh, research and uh, uh, looking at the discussion on how we, we come up with more comprehensive data set, including uh, understanding compared to uh, the forest fire uh, in Indonesia and other part of South Asia. Uh, I, I would like to maybe end my uh, short presentation by looking at how how we move forward. I think uh, I address and uh, emphasize very first beginning that haze pollution in Greater Mekong is not is not uh, it's very complex. So. Uh, one thing that uh, has been ignored is it the, the community rise. Uh, I, I I think uh, when the forest fire came and hair pollution affecting health of people in the region, they are actually pointing finger to uh, smallholder farmer and even though also indigenous community that uh, practicing so-called rotational farming. I think uh, solution, uh, one way, big way we have to uh, push for is to recognize rota rotational farming as a cultural rise for ecological and social uh, uh, social way forward. The another another area of work we we need to do. I, I think we need to continue doing it in a big way is to hold uh, corporate accountable for hate pollution in, in Mekong sub-region. You, you see here in the photo coming from a uh, uh, um, generous friend and from Sarkari Magazine who went to Chan State and taking a uh, perspective of, of uh, what, what happening in Chan State when it's come to industrial made production. We see uh, the link between uh, big corporation and also smallholder farmer who practicing made production. So I, I think in, in this regard, uh, we, we, have to, we have to see uh, the, the relationship between, between uh, industrial large scale monocropping and, and the haze pollution. The last but not least, um, I, I would put it here is that because of the COVID, we have to use this moment of, of disruption to reimagine our future, to co-create vision, 
and the story of hope and action with our friend across region and also decolonize our thinking. Uh, the thinking on, uh, uh, you know, uh, indigenous people is, is the cause of, of forest fire and the cause of hate pollution, for example. At the same time, reaching million to join the journey to fight, uh, uh, to, to, to stop the hate pollution in the region, biodiversity crisis and also the climate, the climate crisis. So uh, I think uh, one last point is that uh, we put an end to, to the extractive industry, mining, uh, agriculture, modernization, and carbon intensive like coal, coal mine and coal power plant, and also advancing the vision and thinking on alternative future. There's a lot of uh, future that we want to see. So it, has to be respected uh, diversities and and uh, uh, our uh, um, common um, the, the the common future we want to see. Uh, I think in in this one uh, we 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 need to build counter power uh, to actually uh, uh, um, with, uh, withdraw the, the, the concept of Western development model. Uh, we also need to build the counter narrative uh, to the, to, as a, at the center point to the forehead and green capital streets narrative, which uh, now uh, I think many countries in Soviet Asia, Thailand go for net zero emission. Lao is going to be a battery of ASEAN, something like that. It it and we need to we need to do uh, both build counter power and also build counter narrative for addressing uh, not on, not only haze pollution in Greater Mekong but also other crises that coming up. I think uh, I I would like to end it here. Thank you, thank you for that. Hope. Thank you very much, Tara. I think within the uh, short time that you had, I think you've given us a good um, uh, bird's eye view of the of the many dimensions in this uh, very complex problem. And also you've touched on some uh, uh, very powerful uh, themes in terms of solutions. Yeah, so thank you very much, Tara. Uh, we will tease out more of the issues that you've uh, touched on uh, later in the second session. Now we turn to the transboundary haze uh, um, emanating from Indonesia. So uh, it's, it's really my pleasure now, I will turn to uh, Wayu Padana. Uh, who will speak about um, some of the facts on the ground and some of the and the causes uh, of this? Now, um, what, uh, hold on, let me just get my notes. Why you works at Walhi, which is Friends of the Earth Indonesia, as a campaign manager on ecosystem essentials, and he's uh, focusing particularly on peat ecosystems and forests. So, uh, why you? Uh, I have the pleasure of inviting you now to give your presentation. Uh, you have about thirteen to fifteen minutes. Thank you, why you? Okay, thank you, Kiyu Jaya. Uh, I will uh, share screen. I hope this. Ah. Okay, thank you. I will more focusing on upstream problem in Indonesia. Sorry, if this is uh, very focusing in Indonesia, but I will try to expand what the impact to the globally. Okay, next. I will show uh, this is a 2000, 2015 condition of hotspot in every place in Indonesia. At least almost more than 103,000 hotspots. I will jump to 2019, where is the haze boundaries. They reach the Sam Thailand area and almost in Malaysia and Singapore. Then why I focusing in this problem? Especially, I will talk about the concession area of corporation. This is the current situation. I think only twice World Bank, they have in their quarterly report, they reporting about the loss of economic uh, causing of forest fire from 2015 and 2019. In, th in 2000. 15, they almost uh, 16 billion USD, the economic loss then in 2015, 
in 2019 I mean is 5.2 billion then this is why I focusing on 2015 and 2019 even the big area of forest fire not as big as 2015 but the daily wildfire emission in 2019 they reach higher in around Augustus or on September, August to September, higher the emission than 2015. I will explain next why that happened. This is one of the problem. In many times, our government blame the indigenous people, especially the way to land clearing in traditional way by fire. But in fact, more than 61% our land owned by concession of the corporate, the corporation. That will be problem. Almost uh, more than 11 million hectares is owned by plantation, more than 33 million hectares owned by forest concessions, especially in timber industries. In other ways, there is many problem. This is the problem of many differences data of plantation in our ministry. The Ministry of Agriculture, they notes uh, more than 20 million hectares, but legally, they at least just 15 million hectares. That will be problem in the of law enforcement. I just uh, realized one data. For 2015 until 2018, the Ministry of Forestry, they have winning deposit against only 11 corporations, especially in forest fire case, they reach more than 16.94 trillion Indonesian rupiah, but none of it, the corporation pays. But in the next problem, we have more big problem because there is new law will waive all the uh, law enforcement. I will show you. Why we focusing on pitland? Uh, many people, especially almost people, they didn't understand. The haze is, can produce from the pitland area, not the mineral area. The problem in our data, satellite data, this is, we take it uh, officially from the satellite of the government, more than 60, more than 36,000 of hotspots indicate on pit ecosystem. Why the pit ecosystem produce haze more bigger than the uh, mineral land. The pit ecosystem, we said they produce the haze from the burning process. The haze come from the pit because they save the ancient carbon in the underground. The other problem, the fires, they not in the on land, but they can underground, difficult to take it out. This is some data. Almost Hageu is the plantation concession permit then problem fire occurs in the pit ecosystem hard to put out they can spread underground in some of our analysis and research they can spread 100 kilometers underground that why that's hard to put out because the underground they produce more haze that haze will be problematic not just in indonesia but globally as climate change I will show you how the condition after the land clearing. Way many corporations, they use the land clearing procedure by fire. This is more cheaper, at least 10 times more cheaper than the traditional or more ecological land clearing. This is some satellite imagery. I just want to show you government recognize and know this problem. This is on 8 March. Uh, 2015, this is on December uh, 2017. 
clearly symmetrically after many burning indicate by many haze uh, the area seems to be plantation the symmetrically this is the canal of the plantation usually canal is for the drying peatland because usually the peatland is very wet this is part of the wetland ecosystem <laughs> two pictures above two picture above is this rainforest destruction in central kalimantan uh, the indigenous people known by the kinipan indigenous people at the last years on 2020 the head of the indigenous people is arrested by police because he against his forest indigenous people area uh, changed by the government to the plantation in other problem this is i directly notes mentioned from the auditory bodies of the state they specifically said more than two million point seven hundred thousand hectares of plantation illegally in forest area this is data auditory on february 2019 but what the problem I think we will face the haze problem more bigger in the next year and, and in the futures. Because after the omnibus bill, many illegally concession in forest area, especially in pitland area, they, in, the reg, in the regulation state, they given three years for administrative stale, settlement. That will be problem because before that will be corporate crime but no this just administrative problem why our government or we sue not just walhi but with the other organization we sue many corporate corporation then we won because we have the strict strict liability norm the strict liability norm specifically then we don't the need to prove the element of guilt if that in your concession in this forest fire that's become that and responsibility but now that norm is i just many approach before but we call it uh, the rsp one of and solved by the RSPO. I will show you how the bank, the in financial institution at the right side, this corporation have case of the forest fire and the left side is the bank. They have the investment directly or they have loan to the corporation. The first is Indonesian banking. This is Bank Rakyat Indonesia. So government said the problem is money as this Malaysian corporation. But the real the money is institutional financial finance institutional finance financial institution they directly just to one big group okay i will close this what be our option uh, the strengthening of the grassroots movement now in the condition of the new regulation after the omnibus bill the Why you? We can't hear you. Have we lost Why you for a, for a moment there? Let's just wait for him to come connect back. Just as we are getting to the good part, the solutions. 
Yeah. Let's just give it a few more moments um, while Wayu tries to reconnect back with us. Or otherwise, uh, Shamila, we can, let's just give it a few more minutes before we uh, proceed to with Shamila. Because I think it seems why you is uh, at the tail end of his presentation, isn't it? And he's identified the um, some problems. It's particularly interesting to see uh, the top 10 creditors uh, a moment ago who were funding um, the concession holders, the companies that were that had fires on their plantation lands. Uh, I spotted a few Malaysian banks. Yes. Malayan banking was the number two uh, top creditor. CIMB bank as well uh, was there. We're still not getting YU back. Maybe we can have uh, YU discuss a little bit about solutions um, uh, later when he does join us. So um, let us proceed now to the uh, third and the last presentation. Um, yeah, I think let's let's do that now. And then uh, maybe YU can have a short discussion later when he comes back. So now I would like to introduce you to our third panelist, uh, Ms. Shamila Arifin. Now, Shamila is the Research and Media Officer at Sahabat Alam Malaysia, which is Friends of the Earth Malaysia, or uh, uh, here locally better known uh, by the acronym SAM, SAM. Now, Shamila has been working with SAM since 2003. The focus areas of her work cover policy and legislative matters on forestry, land, uh, forestry and land governance in Malaysia, mainly on issues affecting indigenous people's customary land rights, and the impacts of activities such as unsustainable logging, monoculture plantations, and large-scale dam building on indigenous territories and forests. Now, Shamala will speak about the political economy of the Indonesian transboundary haze crisis in Southeast Asia. Shamila, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, is my voice okay? Right, so I will share screen now. Hi, sorry, my connection is unstable. Oh, so here. do I stop or what? No, no problem. Why you? Uh, maybe why you? Ah. You were coming to the end of your presentation, right? Was it? Okay. You were talking on about solutions. Okay. Uh, you were, so uh, I maybe will continue briefly. Uh, okay. All right, Shamila. Then. All right. Let's. Why you? Can you just? Uh, yeah. I just, uh, uh, you were on my... solutions, and uh, okay. there were there were three bullet points we saw uh, okay. on your last slide, right? So I yes. I think one the last point is the financial approach is can will be one option. The responsibility not come just to the corporation but to the financial institution, because that at least in the omnibus bill there is more than thirty six uh, investor they send the letter of the protest officially to the government in Indonesia. That's very impactful, but yes, I said this is very sad, but in the next, in the future, in our analysis, we will face more problem in his, especially impactful by his responsibility. His. Thank you. Sorry, Samila. Sorry, everyone, if I have. Uh, it's okay, why you no apologies needed. Thanks very much. Thanks. Uh, very glad to have you back. Now, uh, Shamila, back to you. And please, the floor is yours, Shamila. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I will now uh, uh, share my screen. You can see that, right? Okay. 
device. And you can start. Okay, uh, good. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you to the moderator um, and the other presenters. Um, also, um, shout out to Wahyu um, <laughs> uh, from Indonesia, uh, who has um, uh, brilliantly covered the process and solutions and uh, in, 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 in analyzing the crisis. So I will uh, not be saying anything different from what he will be saying, but only perhaps from a Malaysia uh, perspective from Malaysia, because um, as you know, the fires do not occur here, <laughs> but they come from Indonesia. But we have been suffering this uh, from the haze for some 30, 40 years, depending on when you start counting. Okay, so the title of my presentation is um, Haste and Confused by the Political Economy of the Indonesian Transboundary Haze in Southeast Asia. Why? Because we, we, are, we have been haste in Malaysia and we are confused uh, in Malaysia over like what is the cause of, of, of the crisis, yeah? But just to uh, give the... Um, uh, just to acknowledge the source of my uh, title is actually from a Spotify <laughs> playlist uh, that was made during one of, I think this was made in 2019. I think it was one of the, 2019 was it 2018? One of 2019, one of the worst incidents. Uh, so yeah, this was one of the ways of people, urban people to cope. <laughs> so they made a playlist. Okay, now, um, how I will start. Okay, first, uh, from 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 our side, we need uh, that there is an urgent need to frame the issue correctly in Malaysia. An accurate understanding at an international and national policy level on the political economy of the Indonesian transboundary haze. So the history, the political history and development of the crisis must be fully understood if you wish to resolve the problem. The problem is that from our perspective, from our analysis is that uh, the, 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 the issue is not framed correctly. The parties responsible are blamed uh, for the wrong people, the wrong factors are always blamed. If we have to answer all these four questions here, yeah, um, um, how, 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 which ends with how are we going to find hope? How are we going to resolve it? Okay, so now, I would like to um, stress in my presentation the four questions, and it's all about history and time. We here in Malaysia always ask when the haze arrives again, we will ask uh, who who's responsible? <laughs> Why are they not punished? Uh, is, it the, is it the local farmers? Is it the corporations from Malaysia or what that sort of thing? But if you were to look at all the body of questions being asked in principle, the questions that we ask is related to history. Why? Why? Because it's the, the, the crisis has been, con has been going on for 30, 40 years, depending on when you start counting. Yeah? So essentially, the question would be this. One, why do the fires continue for more than three decades or four decades? Two, how could the fires be allowed to rage so wildly and for so long? I mean, that kind of smoke that can reach in the uh, Philippines, the Philippines and even Thailand, yeah, it's so huge. You cannot imagine how much the local communities in Indonesia themselves suffer. And third, what policy and legal efforts have been undertaken to resolve the crisis in all these years? So we've got general questions asked by the public, but if you try to structure it, you will find that they're essentially asking these three questions or maybe more, but these are the three that we have identified. Okay, now there is this fiction. There are many fictions, many myths going about about the, the cause of the crisis. So I'll try to simplify it. Um, first, yeah, uh, one of the common way, one of the common uh, common narrative is that the, the narrative, the spark and fire. You know, there's no smoke without fire, but there's no fire without spark, right? So I'm trying to simplify it here. Now, the use of fire in agricultural activities in Kalimantan and Sumatra in Indonesia are said to be the sparks that light the fire, and then you have the El Nino. 
a, a phenomenon, a cycle, a climate cycle that is said as to be a, as a catalyst that uncovers the tinder, yeah, the, the, the fuel primarily made of peat and dry vegetative matter, forest and peat land included, which keeps the fires burning for a long period of time. We can understand that sometimes fires may occur, but my God, why couldn't you stop it? And my God, why are these are they so big? Yeah. Now, so but I mean, uh, this, sorry. Yeah? Sorry, uh, when we're talking about spark and fire, can I just talk about the wind? Uh, because I think the audience can hear the wind noise from the fan. Probably it's ah. blowing into your mic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I no, will stop. That's always asking. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt you, Shamila. Okay, I hope there is no wind now. Yes, and perfect, the wind also. Perfect. Yes, and the wind does blow from, from Indonesia up to Peninsula Malaysia. That's correct too. Uh, so that's the other, but we can't do anything about the wind. Yeah. Now, uh, anyway, back to the presentation. While the understanding, this understanding is certainly correct, the perception that they are the underlying causes to the, to the crisis uh, is not, yeah? Okay, now here's the argument. Without sufficient amount of spark, the tinder would have remained ineffective. Without a lot of tinder, any spark would have been relatively controllable. So, Therefore, we need to go to the history before even the fast, the spark meeting first tinder. Yeah. Now the meeting of the spark and the and then we from 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 our, our understanding and study, we have found that the meeting of the spark and tinder is actually the result of specific economic and political decisions grounded in poor governance in Indonesia, closely tied to the international trade of agro commodities that is fueled by our economic capitalist economic system. So uh, we must identify what is the underlying cause and what is just, you know, a physical cause, the spark and the fire. Yeah. Okay. Now, the clarity of history. There are two principal historical facts that cannot be denied. Number one, this transboundary haze crisis is new. There is the newness, the newness of the of the crisis, but the long tradition of using fire in, let's say, shifting agriculture or local um, agricultural activities. So, which means that we've always had the spark. Yeah, people have used fire, but then so the, the end question now: Why was there no copious amount of tinder? So this is how I wish that people could can see, can see, can see, can frame the problem. Now, in the past, indigenous and local farmers in Kalimantan, in Sumatra, uh, even in Borneo, even in, in Southeast Asia, we've always used traditional lead, you know, you use a little bit of fire to, to clear and to cultivate. But this rarely did result in large wildfires. So the existence of transboundary haze is practically impossible. Historically, yes, fires, vegetative fires, that's a correct term, I understand, as, as I understand it in English, they have been recorded to occur in Kalimantan and Sumatra. You can search for the history and you will find them. But their incidence was extremely low, limited to a handful of rare events in the course of a century, only during unusually intense drought periods. Now, when they did occur, they were largely a local event and did not rage as wildly as they do today. In fact, this term transboundary haze did not exist. Yeah, virtually unknown prior to the 1990s in the absence of the experience. Now, we are all, most of us working today who are adults, we were born in the 70s to uh, 80s, 60s, depending on your age, yeah? But if you remember, we didn't have this. We never did have this, yeah, for, for a lot of, you know, starting in the 80s, it was from, from my memory, so my age, I remembered it clearly in the late 1990s. That's when the first they arrived. Before that, we, we didn't. I grew up, I did not grow up like regularly every, every year uh, facing um, the, 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 the haze. So now, back then, this is, we, we have to look at some of the most 
classical or most basic studies we've we've done we've we've done our uh, we've we've researched for them, and and if you were to look at history, the first um, in living memory, which means well. I am still alive, <laughs> um, but but yes, it is true that the first one, it was in 1982 and 1983, around that time, if you remember, we were children, most of us were children at that time, some of you may not have been born. This was in East Kalimantan. This was the first one that was like uh, very, very, uh, you know, terrible that it was reported on all uh, national um, in, in, in the neighboring countries, yeah? Now, this was the first instance that it happened. And uh, then following this, a study was done by the, um, you know, a team of German and Indonesian foresters. This is the title of the, of the study. It's, it is part of a long series of studies. This is just one paper. And these are some of the five, oh, sorry. And these are some of the findings for the lowland forest, for the burnt area. 11% of undisturbed forest was burned. 75% of forest had been disturbed was uh, of forest that had been disturbed was burned. 75% versus 11. And out of the 75, these are the uh, um, the division, yeah? lightly disturbed or what? But the point is here: 75 versus 11. For peat and freshwater swamp forest. 70% of undisturbed <coughs> forest was burned and 97% of disturbed forest was burned. But here's the interesting one. <coughs> Only 1% of the study area had been converted into plantations during this time, about 27 hectares. But 90% of 26,000 26, hectares of these areas were actually burnt. So this was um, at the beginning of the advancement of plantations in Kalimantan. And then 85% um, of um, shifting agricultural land was indeed burnt, but this was actually relatively small. So these were the facts of one of the most important studies that was done following. But with the lessons learned, no, they were studied, but the, the authorities, I presume, did not study. Then again, in 1997, this was personally what I uh, personally remember since I was a, uh, I was a young person at this time. <laughs> I'm still young. Um, then uh, the, this was during uh, the, uh, an El Nino year, yeah? So this was uh, is larger, 8.3 million hectares. And then again, another study was done, but what happens after this, yeah? So later, many other researchers, CSOs have continued to study and report on the crisis. <coughs> Gellert, this is one, and one important study that shows that the findings from such studies, the previous one that I've mentioned, did not result in effective policy change. And they could have, success been successful in preventing the repeat of the event. Although there had been a severe drought in Kalimantan and Sabah during the incidents, it was actually political economy of the resource extraction in Indonesia <clears throat> that was to be blamed for this failure. So these are the names uh, Mia Siscawati, Halina Varki, and also Indonesian CSOs. We have a lot of resources that have um, pointed out to how to solve the problem. <coughs> we also have, <coughs> these are, sorry, I'm coughing. Um, these are some of the examples of foreign and international instruments that perhaps we should look at from you know, a foreigner's perspective in order to address uh, the situation. There is the ASEAN Agreement on Transboundary Haze Pollution. Singapore has one. There is an interesting law from France, French corporate duty of vigilance of law that could be of use uh, to you know, address some of the problems from our side, because we know, yes, there are Malaysia, companies with Malaysian interests um, and foreign interests operating in Indonesia. Uh, but um, the comment on ASEAN agreement on transboundary haze pollution is that it simply is not good enough. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's, it's weak. Hmm? So 
Conclusions. Now, it is much more urgent to ensure that there are optimal governance and legal conditions in Indonesia to end the prolonged forests and pit fires and transboundary haze. You can have conviction of the companies, but a conviction would mean that the crime has already taken place, forest has been lost, and destruction has been done. So while it's good to prevent so so once we have successfully charged and convicted, it's actually a little bit too late as far as the ecosystem is concerned. Yeah. The corporation has no nationality, but its alleged crime has a location. It's more efficient to charge a corporation in the country where a crime has been committed. While, number four, while there may be opportunity to develop legal instruments to hold transnational corporations accountable in their country of origin in a court of law, I believe Mr. Q is also working on this. The main challenge lies in the accessibility to and presentation of evidence during court proceedings. And also existence of a law does not guarantee successful convictions. Yeah, That can only increase if the crime, it's trying where the crime uh, is, has taken place. And number six, without optimal governance and legal conditions, corporations, whether Indonesian or foreign, may continue to break the law. Okay, so now in conclusion, I'm finishing already. These are clarity of verbs, okay? Number one, the crisis is not caused by smallholders or local farmers, and a corporation is not a farmer. We must accept this fact. Number two, the crisis is caused by the unsustainable and unsafe expansion of large monoculture, uh, monocultures for the production of agro commodities on formerly forested and peatland areas, chiefly for the cultivation of oil palm and pop and paper sectors. Um, understanding the process, the capitalist process of over exploiting natural resources and the transfer of risk and impacts to the public sector and communities in the international agro commodity sector. This crisis then is exacerbated by the El Nino um, phenomenon and the crisis is sustained by poor governance in uh, Indonesia. And the crisis therefore can be resolved by recognizing all of the above factors. So these are the simplification of verbs for us. I think that it's very important for us to understand um, like, like who uh, is actually at fault and what do we do, okay? So the clarity of solution is the, the, the reason for this is the advancement of the unsustainable and unsafe expansion of certain agricultural sector in Indonesia in the last 40 years. The failure to keep large swaths of forested and peat land sufficiently moist as how it should be in the wet tropics to the point where their flammability could remain low even during harsh and so periods. So we, uh, we, we must understand it's very difficult for wet tropical islands like Kalimantan and Sumatra to actually produce long lasting and large vegetative fires capable of producing smoke to traverse national boundaries on a predictably regular basis. There is nothing natural about what is happening now. So in order to find a solution, these are the three, it's quite simple really. First, you implement the correct policies and laws that protect forests, peatland, the rights of peoples and communities, indigenous peoples, and promote sustainable agriculture. As you can see, Wahyu's uh, presentation has already shown that they are going in the opposite way. Yeah. Second, ending the financing of the expansion itself. And third, is you, you must also look to, uh, the, the, about the fulfillment of international commitments to protect biodiversity and address climate change. So the solutions technically is really quite simple, is whether um, the actors uh, implied would like to do it or not. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shamila. I think you've uh, also valiantly within your time uh, covered um, the very complex transboundary nature of this uh, uh, crisis. And uh, I, I enjoyed how you've break, break, uh, broken down the anatomy of the uh, problem and analyzed the stakeholders, the factors, and the actors involved in, uh, in this. Oh. So that, 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 was, that was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you to all three panelists. Now, uh, this is, now we move into our um, interactive discussion uh, portion of this panel. 
Uh, I noticed, um, I don't see any questions having come in yet. Uh, so the audience are invited to, to, to put forward the questions. Um, I believe the organizers will feed the questions in. So uh, I have some questions of my own, I think. Uh, and and um, let's, let's start from, uh, since we have a ASEAN, primarily ASEAN audience uh, with us. Um, on, on some similarities uh, between the, uh, Merc the Greater Merkel region, uh, transboundary haze, and the uh, haze uh, in Indonesia, uh, in the southern side of ASEAN. Um, uh, what kinds of similarities and what kinds of differences uh, can, we, can we observe? I invite uh, the three to, to, to give some, you know, uh, your thoughts in terms of, you know, especially considering what you've listened uh, from your fellow panelists today. Um, maybe you can think about that and, 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 and speak. So I will have a first go in terms of uh, what I, uh, in my initial uh, uh, thoughts. I think the, um, from Tara's uh, presentation, I think the, uh, the factors are really uh, 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 many, there are many factors involved. I think Tara touched on coal fire power plants. Uh, and then there's the uh, expansion of the large uh, monoculture, agricultural uh, plantations uh, for uh, exporting of uh, commodities. Now that is the similarity I see uh, with the uh, largely palm oil-based plantation uh, expansion in Indonesia. Uh, but but uh, the, the victims I think are more diverse in Mekong, is that correct to say? Uh, because it spans different countries and uh, perhaps affect people in uh, different ways. Um, Tara, your thoughts comparing the Indonesia transboundary haze and uh, the Greater Mekong area? Thank you, Q. Uh, I think that the short response to, to the question is, is that um, the, the Greater Mekong region transboundary haze uh, uh, has a similarity to Indonesian haze, Malaysian haze in terms of uh, I think ASEAN, in ASEAN, we have transboundary haze pollution agreement, uh, as well as um, ASEAN haze-free roadmap by 2020, right? We, I think we have all those apply across 10 countries of ASEAN member. But uh, I think we see roadmap, the ASEAN haze-free roadmap by 2020, had, had failed, completely failed to actually address, address the root cause of the, of, the, of, the, of the problem. I think that the difference had actually uh, to do with the gap, uh, the knowledge, and also um, because uh, I think in the in, uh, presentation of uh, Shamali, you, you, you see uh, historical perspective and also deeper knowledge in terms of understanding of, of Indonesian haze and Malaysian uh, haze, right? But uh, Mekong, greater Mekong sub-region, region, so, some confusion because of ADB term, um, uh, has not been well understood, uh, especially uh, the connection and relation between a key player uh, from uh, big uh, big agro chemical industry to uh, contact farming through how how the uh, the forests are burned and uh, the the framework that we have in in different country in Greater Mekong, in particular uh, because of uh, Greater Mekong has uh, diverse in terms of political social background. We have Thailand and we have Myanmar, which is we know uh, what's happening in Myanmar. We have Laos uh, and also Vietnam and Cambodia. Different uh, back, uh, uh, sort of social political background, but sharing the same direction of uh, moving toward um, expansion, uh, agriculture, uh, modernization, expansion, and also link with uh, Bell and Road Initiative uh, from China. So it it's quite complex, but it's not really totally well understood at this point. I think that that's from my end. Thank you, Q. Thanks, Tara. Thanks. Why you? Uh, what's your? What are your thoughts? Just quickly. 
on the if comparing the great metal. Okay, I will briefly. I think the similarity is the actors. Why I said like that? Even the many corporation, but the financial institution, they can come from the one or two corporation. The second is there is the problem in in law enforcement, not just in Indonesia, but I think in many countries. I think we will facing the more complex problem, especially in actors. The third, I think the similarity, the interesting one is the global solidarity. We see the new wave of the global solidarity. I just remember at the 2019, at the last years, our some regional offices come to Malaysia, helped by some, uh, fetching some, and hearing with the some uh, legislative bodies of the or the parliamentarian, their parliamentarian. That's more helpfully to push our government to have more law enforcement, even though we facing the new problem now. But I think the global solidarity can come with more face, not just about between uh, social movement with social movement, but including with from the social movement to the other government. I think, thank you. Thank you, Ayu. And interesting. And Shamila, your thoughts? Um, can I can I can you please repeat your question? I just I was just to... talking about a, a quick uh, kind of comparison between the Greater Mekong Transboundary Haze and the Indonesian Transboundary Haze, and just your quick reactions in terms of what you heard today. Um, yeah. yeah, similarities, I, differences. I I don't have I have well um, I am interested in one thing basically. <laughs> so answering your question, I would like to know actually. I'm wondering whether there is similarity uh, in the Mekong region. Um, on um, how protected um, your elites are from the impacts of the trans uh, of, of the crisis. I say this because I've always wondered, and maybe um, why you can also clarify to me that for our crisis, for example, um, I would say that the Indonesian elites have not suffered from them. And they are mostly on the Java Island, and the way I'm saying this because of the wind, uh, <laughs> the fan, yeah, the, the wind is such that the smoke from Sumatra flies to Peninsula Malaysia. It never flies to Jakarta, you know. Now, what would have happened if such a crisis actually? I um, whether there is similarity there, I'm not quite sure from your presentation. Like who suffers? Maybe there is the same because sometimes when the elite community suffer from an environmental catastrophe, you can see it's very quick, they will solve the problem. <laughs> but the Tara, moment they are... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tara, would you like to yeah, respond yeah. to that? Um, the, the, the challenge, I think, for Mekong, Mekong um, Khan Badori has is that uh, at this state, at this state, when we we look at um, the, the 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 main the key player uh, in uh, from so, you know from who who actually in the in the supply chain, for example, maize supply chain, uh, maize production and plantation are in the area, so mostly uh, come with the contract farming. So we uh, we are actually tend to. Uh, put pressure on local community to to be accountable, to be responsible for the haze, for the fire across in the land, uh, occur in the land. But we are not able, I mean, from many aspects, link those supply chain, mass production to the company. Uh, I, I would I would uh, call their name, uh, CP, for example. CP is the biggest uh, feed industry in Thailand. So they're pumping a lot of uh, investment into Mekong region in Chan State, in Lao, and then uh, using contact farming uh, business model. And and then when when uh, the fire occur and the haze uh, uh, dripping from one area to another, 
CP is escaping because they, they are not, uh, they, they avoiding responsibility because of the supply chain. We, we cannot track the supply chain. This is the area of work. Uh, I think uh, one of our colleague in, in Thailand and, and Mekong region to actually address how to link, how to connect so that we, we make them accountable. We don't, we even don't have uh, something, uh, uh, information on land, who own the land, who actually investing, uh, invest, investing on land and that land linked to, you know, linked to CP, for example. So it it uh, something uh, a lot to do, and also the, the the challenge is the piece of land, the, the smallholder farmer in Upper ASEAN, they own very small piece of land, many many of them, right? uh, uh, compared to last uh, piece of palm oil plantation in Indonesia in Sumatra or in Kalimantan, it's very big, but uh, we're talking about uh, a very small piece of land that. Uh, linked to the big corporation in 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 this country. This this is the gap that we have at the moment. Right, right. Yeah. So in that sense, uh, I, I'm weaving together the um, lack of information or lack of transparency in this situation. Uh, kind of blunts the ability to have to critique, to hold people to account, or to see the bigger picture of. You know, I think like what Shamila was getting at, like, uh, is it that there is a group of elites who don't care because they are unaffected? And then who are they? Where are they? But then with uh, when it's shrouded, when there's lack of uh, transparency in uh, behind the corporate masks, behind the complex uh, supply chain, the separate legal entities and the transnational corporations uh, having separate uh, separate legal entities as well. Um, it becomes a challenge, and uh, and that challenge, I think, as Yu in his uh, presentation, uh, together with land tenure and land ownership, also uh, makes it very difficult for grassroots for NGOs to uh, accurately criticize the right parties, or actually to have a sharp commentary on what is wrong, and then push for the for solutions. So I think um, this is this is one thing, and I, I do observe that very often. I think. Um, uh, for example, take mothers who are coping with the health of their children uh, between a Malaysian mother and a Bruneian mother and a Thai mother, they have much more in common with their own elected representatives in the lawmaking parliament or whichever lawmaking body uh, indeed. And I think, um, I think one of the panelists, I think was it Shamila, you mentioned as well that corporations have no nationality um, because if you look behind them, then the shareholders actually perhaps come from everywhere. I think why use a slide uh, showing uh, the, the financiers uh, and then the financiers uh, financing which uh, plantation company. And so uh, I think the nationality uh, aspect is something sometimes very distracting. Uh, when we say Indonesian haze, uh, it's, it's actually coming from the geographical location of Indonesia, but it's, it doesn't mean it's caused by Indonesians. Uh, it's caused by many humans. So who are these humans? It's the polluting humans, and then you have the, the victim human, right? So I think uh, yeah, um, your, your, your presentations have really helped to tease out these important factors. Now we have a question uh, from, from, from the audience. How do you engage with the government's committees in charge of the cross-border haze? How is the work among them uh, look like? Can you explore that a little? So let's talk about government's work uh, in fighting transboundary haze. Uh, quick comment from each of you, or maybe I'll just take two of you. Uh, I, can I go to Tara and then to Shamila? Yeah, um, for Thailand, the Thai government um, um, initiated um, a roadmap to combat haze pollution, but they only focusing on domestic, uh, the impact and uh, uh, domestic matter. When 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 we see when we see Bangkok uh, uh, during the, the dry season with with uh, quality worsening. Uh, and then we see the hotspot uh, and also the haze 
coming out from uh, northern part of Cambodia, uh, southern Laos, with the area of mining concession and also uh, agriculture land owned by Chinese and other foreign investor uh, uh, activity happening there, right? And and uh, the Thai government actually feel the connection. Uh, they say uh, Bangkok uh, air pollution actually coming from uh, vehicle, coming from open burning around Bangkok. It's not coming from Cambodia. I think they 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 make it like very a uh, simplistic uh, narrative of that. So don't blame Cambodia. Blame yourself. <laughs> this is this this is uh, the mindset of of, of Thai, the Thai government. But anyway, they have uh, uh, from time to time intergovernmental meeting with with the the, the country in Mekong, uh, Myanmar, Chiang State, Laos, and Vietnam and Cambodia, and come up with with uh, mechanism to combat to address the the hair pollution in in the region. But so far, it's very really ineffective. It's just a talk shop. It's just a plan on the paper. In reality, uh, we we also see uh, uh, the, the the problem is still going on and worsening in some area. Um, it it's very bad. I mean, uh, when we look at the mindset of of those government in the region, and and also they they don't uh, mention the 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 supply chain, the company in the supply chain, because of the company itself is the government. Thank you. Mm. Thanks, Tara. Shamila, quickly, very quickly, Shamila. Yes, uh, as I have said uh, just now with my presentation, um, the ASEAN Agreement on Transboundary Haze Pollution, that's very weak. Um, and also, um, but then there are plans like to establish the ASEAN Coordinating Center for Transboundary Haze Pollution Control, ACCT, HPC in Indonesia to uh, intensify further cooperation and action, but I don't know how far they have been uh, they, are, they are going. Uh, one more thing that is important that um, we have to remember that in order to execute uh, or, or implement or even look into such matters, uh, transnational um, uh, issues, pollution, the government needs to be stable. <laughs> and now, <laughs> sorry, but in Malaysia in the last two years, the government has not been stable. The parliament was closed for quite some time, so it was very difficult for us to like do work with uh, legislators. For example, when they they couldn't even enter the parliament for quite some time, so the it's it's important um, uh, the stability of a government is is very important um, in, in in of all governments. Yeah, if one is stable, the other is not. It's not going to uh, be. We're not going to be able to address it in a, in, a, in for international regional way. Thanks, Shamina. Uh, uh, another question to uh, Wayu and to Kuntara, uh, or either to Wayu or Tara. Uh, in both the North and South Southeast Asia uh, areas, um, corporations have been identified as major actors. However, I feel that corporations have been able to be held more accountable in the South over the past few years, although not perfectly, compared to those in the North. Can Tara or Wayu give their thoughts on this difference, any notable differences in the political economy of both regions. Um, Maybe quick, uh, quick one is, is uh, I think um, the, 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 the key player in Mekong region ha has, has uh, multiple, right? Uh, and also some corporate has vert vertically integrated business model. So, so that means uh, it, it really, uh, I think it takes time to actually track the, the supply chain. I think we, we, have, we have a tool to, to, to be able to track them, but it it's takes uh, a lot of intensive, labor intensive and, and time, consumer, time consuming. Uh, I, the, 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 the short answer is that because of the gap that we have, we, uh, at, the, at this point, we are not able to make them more accountable or even, even accountable at this, at this, at this state. So uh, another, another, another aspect is, is that when it comes to legal uh, mechanism, uh, we see in the past Singapore uh, initiate the uh, uh, Time Boundary Head Act, right? 
uh, we all, we also expecting uh, Thai government uh, pro probably do the same, but because of uh, it is not uh, it's not Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore relation, but it Thailand, Chan State, Lao, Cambodia, and Vietnam relation. So it it a little bit more complex. So the the supply chain actually going into different direction. In, they're moving from Thailand, Northern Thailand to Chan State, and then Northern Laos, and then Vietnam. So it 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 quite a big piece of work. But I think that uh, also uh, reflect uh, the difficulty and challenge we have. But I think we will we will overcome it. Thanks, Sarah. We have to make it. Thanks, Sarah. Why you any comments? Oh, why you you on mute? Okay, sorry. Okay, the first about the transboundary haze, as long as that not legally binding treaties, that will be ineffective. The second, how we communicate with the corporation. I think every each in supply chain process, now with the technology, they must have responsibilities to the upstream uh, process in the ground because we sometimes we have worry with the eco labeling become the some quote unquote greenwashing. That's why we push the labeling must have impact to the to the economic directly. That's why we propose the even the financial institution they have must have the res responsibilities. How we communicate with them? I think. We need more powerful bargaining position at the ground level, at the grassroots uh, movement. Because if we have you no know, bargaining position strong enough, the diplomacy between the uh, civil society with the corporation, between civil society with the states, only just enough in diplomacy with it, in not impactful to the reducing the haze problem, the ecological problem. I think we need more fishing. All every supply chain level, they have much responsibilities. Thank you. Excellent, Wayu. Thank you. Okay, another question, and this is uh, to a question for Shamila. Can you share Sabah Alam Malaysia's strategies to push for better governance on haze? Do you primarily engage with the Malaysian or foreign governments? How do you read Malaysia's view on engagement now, especially since they recently backtracked on the transboundary haze law for Malaysia? Oops, Shamila, you're on mute. Uh, can you repeat one by one? Can you I, you, so, you spoke uh, very fast. Number, four, okay. number one. The first one was, can you share Sam's strategies to push for better governance on haze? Do you primarily engage with the Malaysian or foreign governments? And then how do you read Malaysia's engagement now, uh, especially since they have recently backtracked on the domestic transboundary haze law? Okay, thank you for the questions. Um, number one, what is our strategy to push for better governance? Um, whether, well, well, actually, um, we, not question number one, number two, our previous strategy actually was more um, focused on legislators, on federal lawmakers, and we had hoped to take that channel uh, further. Um, you know, you have the chair of the uh, ASEAN, Parliamentarians on Human Rights, right? So APCHR, yeah, they are parliamentary. Yeah, that would be a good channel. Uh, I'm sorry to say that we have not looked um, very uh, deeply um, to uh, we, on, on on the government, the executive itself. Um, but that is also mainly uh, the question is how do we read that development? It's very difficult to read anything in Malaysia right now because the government is not stable and I would rather not conclude anything because like if you conclude something now, then we, 
next year or what God knows what will happen. So um, that's why I stress this now. It's important stability of, of, of government and legitimacy of government is important. Plus, now we have got this COVID-19 that will come, that will be here for quite some time and um, governments will be busy responding to this crisis too. So how do I read it? I don't know because I cannot read the government right now or in the past two years or in the next two years until certain things are resolved. Thank you. Yes. All right, Shamila, thank you very much. So we have one minute left on the uh, time counter for this panel. Uh, I would like to wrap up uh, this, this really uh, a powerful session actually with by going around uh, the three of you to ask for your thoughts um, for uh, global solidarity. I think um, we uh, agree that global that solidarity has been improving uh, in recent years. So um, how can we enhance this? Yeah, I think this this platform was uh, uh, the Miao conference. This forum has been fantastic. I think share your your sharing has been really good. Uh, I've gained a lot from uh, your work and your perspectives. So um, can I invite each of you to to talk about like your just very briefly your what do you think we can do more or keep doing or improve in terms of enhancing uh, this global solidarity to working together? Uh, can I start with Tara? Yes, um, when, when we work on greater Mekong haze pollution, we actually uh, looking at the Indonesian haze, primary haze pollution. I think at some point it's affecting uh, not only Malaysia, but Southern, pa Southern Thailand. So uh, we, we also want to see a uh, legal framework, legal mechanism, and also uh, transparency, accountability work around how we make corporate accountable in, Mac in Mekong region. I think we, we, we can actually learn from each other, continue uh, learning from each other, especially the experience from Malaysia and Indonesia. Thank you. Thanks, Tara. Why are you? How about you? Okay, thank you. Uh, I think like how the corporation play the process in global solidarity. I think the social movement made more closely. We have many experience if we work together. It's more easier, have pressure and more impactful. The last time I just share our experience with the Greenpeace in, we have same research in Papua. That's very impactful. Even the corporation, they against back then suing the local government just imagine what we facing now not just the corporation but the oligarch of politics because even we have government good government they will swing by the corporation because they reducing some uh, plantation permit the impact to the haze pollution i think at the next level this is we need more strategic working together between social movement and some good government in every place globally. I think that, thank you, and nice to meet you all. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for you. Thanks thank for you. you. And, Sh and Shamila, your thoughts on this? Um, yeah, I think globally, um, um, uh, uh, global international level, um, looking at finance is really one way forward because that's where the money comes. Uh, work can be done um, to, to look into that and, and also international commitments that all countries must fulfill now, biodiversity, climate change. So these are some of the two areas of work where social movement CSOs can focus on. Um, apart from national movements that, that, that we have no choice, like each of us in our country, we have to continue demanding accountability and transparency, working towards that in our own countries. Um, yeah. But internationally, there's finance, and then there's also international treaties, agreements that can be looked into, and even human rights. Yeah, the right to clean air, the right to um, a healthy environment. Um, many countries are also doing that and internationally we should also look into that. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Shamila. 
Tara and Wayu, and indeed the voices um, of, of uh, the others besides the voices of the interests of the corporations, the voices of the political leaders, um, the voices of the people uh, across the whole fabric of society uh, and all our different societies and regional society. Uh, we need to build the counter power and the counter narratives to borrow Tara's words and uh, thank you very much for the organizers for this session. I think it's been a very fruitful discussion. Uh, and what remains is to thank the audience for the questions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, moderator, and also the panelists for fruitful discussions of uh, on transboundary has pollution in Southeast Asia. I guess the global solidarity is one of the key terms to take away and hope that it will help to uh, promote and also to overcome the transboundary has in these uh, regions. And next, we are going to have the 30 minute break and we will resume back at 11.30 a.m. Bangkok Thailand time.